As about 200 people stood across the street from the Russian embassy in Ottawa on Sunday, most of them were holding up yellow and blue signs in solidarity with the people of Ukraine. But there was one sign in black and white that had a menorah on it and the words, Let Ukraine Live, We Are Family, signed Canada's Jews. Holding the sign up was Alti Rodel. The Ottawa historian is the daughter of Holocaust survivors. She was born in Chernowitz, Ukraine, after the war. She's lived in Ottawa for many years, and she's been working to help teach Ukrainians about their country's shared history with the Jews, including the bad history, like the one million Jews in Ukraine who were murdered during the Holocaust, including at Babi Yar. So it's breaking her heart to know that all the museum exhibits and conferences and school tours and the restoration of Jewish cemetery projects that she's been leading in Ukraine are in jeopardy now, in a country she says nearly every Ashkenazi Jew in the world originally comes from. It can't be good for uh, for Jews or anybody else uh, when there is this kind of uh, intimidation and um, no mafia style uh, actions. I'm Ellen Besner, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like for Tuesday, the 1st of March, 2022. Welcome to the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. <music> Alti Rodel and her husband Beryl Rodel founded their group, the Ukrainian Jewish Encounter, back in 2007. They're Canada's foremost experts on the topic, and they hope to bridge the long-standing distrust between Jews and Ukrainians dating back to wartime. Many Jews still believe the Ukrainians were the worst Nazi collaborators of all. Her group's aim isn't to forget what happened. How could she? Three of her grandparents are buried in mass graves there. Instead, they want to get both sides, Jews and Ukrainians, to understand their shared thousand-year history and forge a new relationship. That's why the Ukrainian-Canadian Congress was invited to join in the official Jewish memorial service for Babi Yar in Ottawa last fall. Coming up, Alti Rodal will be here to share how her group is reacting to the invasion of Ukraine. But first, here's what's making news elsewhere in Canada right now. I'm Karen Bessner in downtown Toronto, and this is what Jewish Canada sounds like. There's been some good news about the fate of Eli Sherbatov, the Israeli-Canadian Jewish hockey player from Montreal. The 30-year-old was playing left wing in Ukraine as a member of the Mariupol hockey team. He decided to flee when the hostilities started. Sherbatov told his Instagram followers he spent six days and nights on the run. It's not clear how he escaped, but he's now safe in a hotel in Warsaw, Poland. He does have an Israeli passport. He says he got some help from Israelis along the way, and he'll soon be reunited with his family. Sherbatov has played for Israel's hockey program before, and he made news headlines last year when he purposely signed on to play for a team in Auschwitz, Poland. And Alti Rodal joins me now from Ottawa. Most people who would be listening to this podcast um, probably come from Ukraine. Is that correct? Well, I would say that uh, not just Canada, but uh, North America, South America, Israel, the Ashkenazi community was concentrated in the Pale of Settlement, which historians uh, and you would, would, have, would know about. And uh, it's from there that the majority in, emigrated to other places. That whole Holocaust story is basically the one that everybody thinks about when they think about Jews in Ukraine, right? Babi Yar and other places. How do you work with your with your group to try to overcome this huge historic trauma? In the first stage, it's a reconciliation of narratives, and then if you understand, if you that includes everybody who's involved in the in the exercise, appreciates that there is a, a an authentic story, and one that has been built and the constructs for various reasons, political or otherwise were in the, during the Soviet period, especially there are many layers that uh, were encrusted and that what, what we do have are stereotypes. So we try to uh, attack those and, and dispel those stereotypes. Most stereotypes have grains of truth. And, and this is what, if everybody uh, who's involved uh, agrees, yes, this happened, then you can call it a reconciliation. It's an acknowledgement. It, it's not about, uh, well, you know, uh, let us forget about the past and uh, or let's not think about that part of the past. It's it's uh, acknowledging the past and moving beyond it. What were some of the stereotypes 
let's just list a couple that Jews were seen as by the history books, by the Soviets, by the, the propaganda, as you just mentioned. It's varied um, from um, Jews as exploiters, the agents of the, of the dominating cultures, the Poles, then the Russians. Um, Jews were caught in the middle in, in very complex uh, uh, intercultural, inter-ethnic uh, conflicts in the region. And it's such a complicated history. So many successive regimes. Uh, Ukrainians were, for the most part, uh, with, with a, you know, only very short periods, they had a state, but they were subject to all these different occupying uh, ruling systems that oppressed them. They, they were a, a suffering group from being serfs and, uh, and to, to being uh, suppressed culturally. And beyond culturally, you know, there were there were crises times for for Ukrainians and the Great Famine, but it affected the entire population. And this is something that one should always keep in mind. Jews have been a minority, at, you know, before the war, a significant minority, uh, but uh, whatever crises happened affected the Jews uh, sometimes more so than others because they were a vulnerable group. Yeah, when Putin says he's coming in to denazify Ukraine, how do Jewish groups, how, do you, how does that sit with you? Well, the, the immediate reaction, and this is pretty universal, this is ridiculous, it's absurd. Uh, there's, there's a Jewish president, uh, by the way, the Minister of Defense is also Jewish. Uh, it's uh, you know, Jews are equal citizens to everybody else. They have the protection of the law, um, anti-Semitism, there are some, as everywhere else, and it's dealt with quite properly by the officials. And there's the added uh, uh, aspect that, uh, that Russia has been trying to divide and destabilize Ukraine in all kinds of ways. Hybrid war, we call it. And it, and it is there. And since, especially since 2014, uh, the Jewish card has been one of the tools that has been uh, uh, targeted by by the Russians, and Jews are aware of it. How much in danger do you think the Jewish community in Ukraine uh, are in right now because of being, as you said, in the middle? I would say that they are in no greater danger than the rest of the population. And what do you what do you see in terms of the Jewish life, Jewish community in uh, in Ukraine? Who's there now and what does the community look like? What are the big cities? Just give us a little bit of your experience. Well, um, first of all, it's still uh, the second largest Jewish community in Europe. I believe it's the fourth in the world. Um, it, it depends how you count. Uh, you'll find a very wide range. Uh, uh, there is the, you know, the halachic Jews who, you know, people say 70,000. Today I read it's 43,000, which sounds to me uh, really an underestimate. Um, and then there is those who are eligible for Aliyah, so at least one Jewish grandparent. And there you can be 300,000, 500,000. There, there are also reasons why people want to have bigger numbers, um, but it, it does range very widely depending on whom you're counting. And the, the Jewish agency, for example, example speaks of 350,000. Um, the uh, you know, the European Jewish Congress, slightly less than that. It's, it's still a, a very substantial community. And um, uh, they are largely in the large cities and they are in the cities that are being hit now with, with bombs and explosions. Um, they are sheltering, they are um, ready to leave if they, if, you know, if they absolutely have to. And uh, some have, got, have already left for Israel. Um, most would like to stay put. Um, most are actually very uh, patriotic and, and want to see uh, Ukraine come out of this uh, without, so many, without the damage that is being threatened. And you, you've got several generations to consider. You've got the elderly, who are those who did not leave when emigration was at its height. Uh, the younger generation is much more mobile, but they are also staying in, in the lot for the most part. Um, those who wanted to leave have left already, and those who have uh, you know, stronger connections with Ukraine. Uh, and, and I should say also that even those who've left and are in Israel still have strong connections with Ukraine. There are about a half a million uh, Jews in Israel originally or with some connection to Ukraine. 
and they still feel those bonds quite strongly. There are a lot of very important Jewish sites cultural sites, cemeteries, pilgrimage sites, especially a lot of uh, people might know about the, the Rosh Hashanah pilgrimage tradition where thousands and thousands, tens of thousands, right? They go to the, the grave of the one of the founders of the Bratislav dynasty. There's a map of, of uh, such sites and it's, uh, it's quite mind boggling how widespread uh, the um, connections are within Ukraine itself. Can we turn back, look at Canada a little bit um, in terms of the relationship between the Ukrainian non-Jews in Canada and Jews? The, first of all, relations between the two communities um, are, are very good, very normal, very uh, amicable. Um, uh, Ukraine itself has been uh, supportive of Israel. There were some tense moments at the time when the war crimes issue, uh, in which I was much involved, uh, as you may know, was director of research for uh, the Deschen Commission, um, that was a period of tension, and that's a separate story. Um, but uh, the experience we've had over the last 15 years uh, or so of, uh, of uh, actively being involved uh, with, the, with the two communities, doing things together, uh, has been uh, really impressive. Um, I'll give an example. One is the Ukrainian festival in Toronto. People, the Jews who walk there are really drawn to the Ukrainian uh, booth, and they're so interested to, to look at the map. Uh, oh, I, my family comes from here and there and there. Uh, so the, these connections come to the fourth. Um, uh, personally, I uh, organized a traveling exhibit on the, the thousand year history of uh, Ukrainian Jewish interaction. It was in Montreal, in Winnipeg, in Edmonton, uh, and of course in Toronto. Um, and it took place in community centers and museums, uh, Jewish and Ukrainian. And the, it, it drew a large number of people uh, from both communities and uh, they worked together to make it happen. Uh, so that's, that's a, a, an indicator. So in 2019, it was shown uh, at the uh, Lviv Historical Museum that it attracted about 20,000 uh, visitors in one summer. And uh, the comments that we got were all very positive and, and encouraging. And that's what Jewish Canada sounds like for this episode of the CJN Daily, sponsored by Metropia. Integrity, community, quality, and customer care. Today's listener shout-out goes to the family of our dear friend and colleague, Steve Arnold. You'll likely recognize his name. Steve has been a reporter for the CJN for the past few years. He's written over 100 stories for us, before that, he was a highly respected journalist with the Hamilton Spectator. Steve suffered a tragic accident a week ago. He died of his injuries on Sunday. His funeral is Tuesday in Hamilton. We are all devastated by his loss. Steve has one unfinished story that he was working on before he died. It was an interview with Dr. May Cohen, a trailblazing pioneer for women's rights in medicine. We will complete the story for him and bring it to you in the coming days. Meanwhile, we'll end the show with this cute exchange from that Zoom call between Dr. Cohen and Steve. Well, you've been working for CJN for years. I remember you doing an interview with me many, many years ago. Yeah. It was uh, just a couple of years ago. I, After I retired from The Spectator, I, I got bored watching TV and playing video games after a while, so... <laughs> started looking for something to do and the, the cjn seemed like a, a natural fit oh so here you are here i am 